if any of you use things like FaceTime or WhatsApp or Skype or Messenger and you're freely talking to people by clicking on a, um, an icon, not thinking about where they are, where that person you're communicating with is in the world or how long you're going to talk to them, and you're doing it for free, well, you're welcome. Well, this is Alan Percy, and I'm here with Jeff Pulver. We're talking about the origins of Voice of IP and how he got involved with his Vaughn conference. So an industry like Voice of IP or telecommunications really wouldn't exist if it weren't for a place to have uh, an opportunity for sellers to meet buyers. And one of the key things about our industry was that we were able to have some early conferences that recognized the technology and recognized the opportunity. And to make that happen, one of the key folks that are involved in this whole thing is Jeff Pulver. And Jeff is with me today. We're here at IT Expo. Uh, and Jeff, thanks for spending a couple minutes with me. Happy to be here. All right. So we were just chatting about um, sort of the early days, right? And we share a common passion together. And uh, we started out with our ham radio licenses. And I love the story about how you eventually found Voice for IP. So would you just spend a couple minutes and share that with us? All right. Um, sure. So the, the genesis of uh, my involvement in, in Voice for IP couldn't, would not have happened if 20 years before that I wasn't um, growing up in a world that, well, I wasn't around, it wasn't that I wasn't around people, but I wasn't connecting or communicating with anybody. And uh, my father got his brother, my uncle Fred, to take me to his office. And this is like back when I'm like, I don't know, somewhere between nine and 10 years old. And and I have no idea what I'm in for. And I, I basically got, my uncle was in the uh, cable TV test equipment business. He had a public company and he had a factory in, in uh, Farmingdale. And I went for a factory tour. And at the end of the tour, he brings me into this room that was a, maybe eight feet by 10 feet. And I sit on one side of this desk and I didn't notice till afterwards that it was a box and that he had a, a what turned out to be a microphone on the other side of the box. And what I found fascinating was he closes the door and uh, he flips a switch and these two start to glow like his, his radio was glowing because there were radio tubes in there and and then he turns flips another switch and I start to hear um, voices but it's really noise really he thinks he's hearing voices all I'm hearing is noise and he tunes a dial and it's like lots of static but he finds a clear spot and he speaks this very cryptic, la cryptic language he says uh, CQ CQ this is K2QQ I'm calling CQ and he says it again for about a minute and he lets go of his microphone and then voila for an hour <laughs> people had queued up to communicate to my uncle because I didn't realize CQ means seeking you yeah. and he put out a seek to the universe to communicate communicate with people and it didn't matter whether he's talking to people from the USSR or from South America or from anywhere in America everybody spoke English and everybody wanted to talk to my uncle and all he said his name was Fred he's yeah. in Farmingdale New York and he gave a signal report and I was amazed that my uncle was so popular and I realized that before I was leaving that my uncle had the cure for loneliness and all I had to do is take that box off his desk and bring it into my bedroom and then before school and after school I could have friends right. and, but there was a catch so my uncle actually wouldn't give me his radio and I turned out I had to be licensed right. and not only to be licensed I had to teach myself college level physics I had to teach myself Morse code right. and then the rules and regulations of amateur, uh, to be a ham radio operator and uh, it took time I, I actually um, you know spent a good two plus years practicing, learning, and finally, when I was 12 and a half, I had my ham radio license. Wow, and you, the, you were a lot earlier than me. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and it's basically, ever since I've had my license to communicate, I haven't shut up. Yeah, we've noticed. <laughs> and, thank you. And it, it was, uh, the, my, my first few years on amateur radio, I, one of the things I loved doing were phone patches. I don't know yep. why it was, yep. but if I had friends in Puerto Rico, friends in, in Toronto, friends in Tel Aviv, um, I would actually patch the rel that I would use the phone patch for rel I would patch the telephone and the radio together so they could speak for free mm -hmm. to their friends and family and I facilitated that and I loved that and I was always fascinated by that and then when I was going to university I remember the summer that I was uh, incoming freshman in my car I figured within a 30 mile radius of my parents house I was able to on two meters uh, through touch tone and auto patch get dial tone so in the early 80s I had a mobile phone and uh 
uh, it didn't really work out too well for my social life because I, I tried getting people, to, these women, to come check out my, my whatever, and they like totally miscommunication. <laughs> but it, it was my passion. And then, as life would have its way, um, back in um, in 1992, uh, and then into three, I started working on Wall Street, and uh, this is back when the internet was still uh, mysterious. And I had the job of uh, I was in, I was a VP of information technology, but I was the one responsible for internet, and I was the one responsible for new technologies. We had a thousand people in the company, 125 people in systems, 124 people responsible for keeping things the way they were. I was the person responsible for new stuff, so not a lot of new stuff came in. But but in my exploring of the future, I discovered um, people talking on the internet, and while they were closed networks, I downloaded the software, and finally. Um, I discovered you could talk on the internet and then I was on I discovered video on the internet in 94 something called see you see me and these like little 120 by 160 black and white images that maybe got five to seven frames per second but it was like moving pictures yeah. and I was on the see you see me mailing list and I discovered that on February 12th 9, uh, 1995 I could download some software let me speak on the internet and I did so and it turned well, out- and just to interrupt for a quick second one of the interesting little points uh, to our listeners is that interview I did uh, um, with Alan Cohen, who I spoke with yesterday, by the way, Jeff. Uh, and this is where the intersection of these two conversations happen, because uh, Alan explained, you know, his early days with the iPhone, right, which was his internet-based... Uh, did, did he point out that the, the first iPhone was not born in Silicon Valley in 2007? Yes, no, he made sure everybody knew that uh, that uh, how it, it came to be. Uh, he, originally, he you know, he built the application called the iPhone. So if you haven't heard it, you know, I definitely recommend listening to uh, Elon's... Um, uh, interview, which also on the podcast here. So anyway, continue. So um, the the and it was he had he actually had an enterprise chat software platform before he actually had the the internet phone or iPhone as we called it. Right. And when after it launched, very shortly after it launched, I created a mailing list for people interested in what in the technology, so that when we're not online, we could be offline and, and communicate. And right. people started posting to this mailing list questions. I started answering. Uh, not because I was an expert in telecommunications or the internet, but it was my mailing list. I answered. And very quickly, thousands of people subscribed to the mailing list. And in September of 1995, someone asked, is it possible to interconnect a telephone and a computer? To which I responded, yes, because I dusted off my old phone patch and it worked. Right. Over that weekend that followed, it was mid-September, um, I met a guy from Jakarta, Indonesia, who had a lot more time on his hands than I did, mm-hmm. and he explained to me that that if, if I use a Cirrus chipset logic um, uh, modem, in my, if I put two of them in my computer, he had written to the API of iPhone. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I cross-connected mm-hmm. the sound, a sound card. I basically had a, a, a gateway, a one-line gateway. So I right. dial tone, and I had um, internet access. And I'd be able to have, okay, there was no echo cancellation, no jitter buffer, no quality service, but I was effectively able to dial out. And uh, he and I architected something called the Global Server Network, or the, G- the GSN, um, which figured out what nodes were online and offline. Right. And free wall dial-up was born. And then in, uh, within 30 days, we launched FWD, which was the first uh, phone network to run on the internet, uh, seven years before Skype. And it, it, it opened up the eyes of a possibility of what could be, and this was you know a year before Dialogic would come out um, with their gateway products. This is you know yep. I, I I inadvertently donated my IPR to the world since yes. I never filed any patents yes. for it. Right. Um, so billions upon billions of dollars of revenue would be generated by somebody, but but hey, it was fun. Yeah. And. Uh, the advent of free will dial up and free will dial up actually lasted four different times but back in 95 it was the opportunity of what could be and that um, and then just life would have its way um, because of such a re- in, in six months later 300 phone companies petitioned the Federal Communications Commission for the sale and use of internet telephony software to be banned in America and the makers to be regulated as phone companies and the response on the mailing list was outrage sure. and so these three days in March of 96 people were asking me what was I going to do about it and so I had a nightlife where I was running free will dial up my day job was on Wall Street and um, I decided okay let's fight so 10 days later the Voice of the Net Coalition was born and PA Yes. For nine years, we helped keep voice over IP unregulated in America. And then um, I got fired from my day job in July of 96, which saved my life. So I'm always grateful for that. Right. Another whole side story. I, I always tell yeah. people getting fired can save your life. Yeah. Right, right. And then in September 10th and 11th, 1996, 
I ran my first ever communication focused event in New York City at the Puck Building called yeah. The Talking Net. And I looked at the future of voice and video on the internet. And I had the team from Local Tech and from CUC Me and uh, Delta 3 came there to launch their service. And so many pioneers, even from Netscape, they all came to talk about the present but also the future of uh, voice and video on the internet. And then and then September then uh, September came and went and uh, such great feedback happened that I decided to commit to doing my follow-up event in Silicon Valley in San Francisco at the Ritz-Carlton. I think it was April 1st mm-hmm. to the th- uh, first to the 3rd. Um, and I changed the name of the event from the Talking Net to Vaughn because in 95, I, I, was, I had a column on, in Boardwatch Magazine and I coined the term Vaughn to be voice and video on the net. Mm-hmm. And, and that event was historic in the sense that not only... So we had 224 people who came to the September event about 500 people came to the uh, San Francisco event, including one guy who, like myself, grew up listening to radio. Mm-hmm. And he had a startup that he was he was he was he was absolutely certain that people wanted to listen to the high school sports from the from the cities they grew up in, regardless of where they're living mm-hmm. that day. Mm-hmm. So he grew mm-hmm. up in Dallas, and you're you're in San Francisco. You want to hear your high school sports team. I had other reasons why I wanted to listen to the radio, but I found it fascinating because. Back in 95, I was actually, for a short time, the moderator of the Real Audio mailing list. Uh-huh. I also had Real Audio server number 10. Wow. So in, before there was streaming video and live video on the internet, I was audio casting on the internet. Sure. Before podcasts were cool. Right. Right. One, one of my early internet friends, who used to be a VJ on um, MTV, supposedly created the concept of a podcast and has always debated against this guy, Dave Weiner. Uh, but anyway, he's not fighting that. <laughs> This guy shows. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry yeah. about that. Um, yeah. So this guy shows up at the conference, pitches his company that um, that, that allows you to listen to radio stations on the internet. And um, anyway, uh, like by the year 2000, this guy, his name, I knew him as Mark. By the year 2000, he changed the name of the company from AudioNet to Broadcast.com, and um, and that's Mark Cuban. I yeah. think he sold it to uh, Yahoo for like four point six billion dollars, yeah. and supposedly made more money shorting Yahoo stock. <laughs> but I knew Mark, and then for the tenth anniversary of Vaughn, I tried getting him to come back back in uh, uh, in uh, two thousand uh, seven, and he told me dust off my old PowerPoint deck from ten years ago because the vision still hasn't happened yet. Wow! Yeah, but but yeah. that that but Vaughn was sort of that for that first so the so the talking net had people that were in research that would go on in history to start building dollar companies or right. divisions of companies um, and it was all about the future opportunities of what could be and with the, and I had come from the world of not telecom I, I never thought of myself as a telecom expert or that I one day would be the founder of Vonage or anything else I was doing this for a completely different reason and in, and in April of 97 what I started to see was um, companies coming together trying to understand that future and I was very attractive to people on the fringe and the edge right. people from countries that I had never heard of at that time showing up together with people from mainstream companies and telecom and again I didn't understand the, the difference between a bellhead and a nethead I had like no clue or the the, the bent up uh, fellowship uh, and, and, and animosity to some extent and how passionate some people could be about protocols and about how they drive things drive the future together but Vaughn started becoming a marketplace between um of the buyers and sellers, but yeah, the technology it, sellers, and also two of the people who are trying to build applications, and that's where they all rendezvoused. And, and and really, even back then, it was also the guys who were on the edge in the ecosystem. You had people ultimately creating chips who needed the board vendors, the guys building the the systems integrators, and of course the early purchasers of the stuff. And then by the by September, I had a, my first the, the fall two thousand uh, fall nineteen ninety seven Vaughn was in Boston, mm-hmm. and that grew, that was in the Boston World Trade Center. That grew to about eight hundred people, and. What was fascinating to me was a weekend before the conference, I got a phone call from these guys from Texas who wanted to demonstrate to me their, their internet telephony system. I invited them to my house, and it, they, had, um, they were using uh, RJ45. Mm-hmm. And I knew already from all these really bad um, uh, demos I've seen over the past year and a half before that not to look to the person that's talking because it always be delay is like a bad dub of a Japanese movie for me. Yeah, Because right. it's just out of sync. Yeah, the, but the guy says, you look at me. And um, and I didn't believe it, but it was actually the first um, inter- IP-based PBX that I ever saw. It was from a guy in Texas called Celsius. Ah, uh, yeah. And uh, on the day before, I, I never spoke. And then for, in '96 and in, in, in spring '97, I never spoke at the conference. I did the opening remarks 
um, at full 97 Vaughn, and during my remarks, I outed Celsius. And then I formally introduced uh, Alistair Woodman yep. uh, at Cisco to, yep. to Celsius, and that was the born of, boom, a $6 billion business opportunity because ultimately Cisco bought um, uh, Celsius, Celsius yep. and they grew their whole business. And you know, it, by the time Full 98 Vaughn came along, um, back in the day, early days of Vaughn, no one could have more than a, 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 a 20 by 20 booth. And you know, the revenue was going, growing uh, geometrically, but I had this idea of parity. But during the between spring uh, between spring '98 Vaughn and fall '98 Vaughn, four vendors, basically Nortel, uh, Ericsson, Lucent, and Cisco, purchased like 50 companies. Holy mackerel! So they yeah. all ganged up on me on the show floor. Yeah. And they said if I don't allow them yeah. to have bigger booths, they're they are not going to come to my conference right. or support it because they couldn't be it was a, they couldn't compete. Wow. And during the history of Vaughn, over 120 companies, 120 of my exhibitors were acquired by seven other exhibitors, right. and over 35 companies would go public. Wow. That's some interesting uh, statistics. And, and, you know, and I got very active. Because, you know, my initiation in this whole space was regulatory. Yeah. So being the founding chairman of the Voice on Net Coalition gave me a platform to uh, try to understand that fear, greed, and disruption, if you see that, it means you're doing something right. right. Because if, if you're invoking fear in incumbents um, and then you can see how the incumbents are getting greedy because of what, what they may miss out in and ultimately when they start going to their um, lobbyists to, to uh, refer to laws that were invented 50 years but created 50 years before the technology that's mm-hmm. disrupting them you know you're on to something I've always been proactive with that, and 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 anyway, Vaughn grew to um, at a peak. I think we had somewhere between six and seven thousand people come to the event. Right. We we sold out the uh, consistently sold out the San Jose Convention Center, the Boston uh, Convention Center, and then after a year of doing it in uh, the U.S., I did I, I introduced Vaughn Europe. We started doing events mm-hmm. in, in uh, Oslo, Helsinki, in Helsinki, in Stockholm, and London, and then I did uh, Vaughn Canada. I tried doing Vaughn Canada like in two thousand and three. And before the first event, I got a letter from the Victorian Order of Nurse, the Victorian Order of Nurses for a cease and desist. Because apparently, in, in in Canada, the Victoria Order of Nurses is known as Vaughn. Oh. <laughs> so I was not Vaughn Canada. I was I became Voice on the Net Canada. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it just, but the whole thing flourished by creating an opportunity for people to connect, yeah. and you know, it was allowing the the customers to speak. That yeah. the, the phone con- ultimately the carrier is the. The, the people who are creating the technology who had you know something to say and and and, and cross connecting those dots and so we, we became a real life marketplace right right and and of course you know remember too looking back at the situation you know, this is multi billion dollar telecommunications industry that was now to be disrupted right in this ecosystem that was created as a side effect it basically created an environment where the you know the underpinnings of the telecommunications industry could be replaced with new technology that was not controlled by a handful of uh, highly regulated no. service providers and in fact what you saw popping up were tons of internet telephony service providers all of a sudden the incumbents were competing against next gen telcos companies that would just show up and operate and compete and, and unlike the telcos which had to deal with regulated uh, tariffs people were bypassing tariffs by going over the internet and uh, just doing local origination local termination and it worked uh, in fact uh, before there was Vonage there was the minutes exchange because I created a B2B network mm-hmm. for the trading of telecom minutes mm-hmm. uh, in 98 and then in 2001, it, it became it pivoted into what's known as Vonage today. The the thing that I, you know, uh, really really uh, excited about is when you look back in the evolution of communications. You know, it was the CEO of AT&T in 1964 at the World's Fair in New York City that shared a vision of video being mm-hmm. the future. Mm-hmm. And all those generations after that, people spoke video, they pushed video on corporate networks, but really didn't happen to the consumer right. until the uh, late 2000s. But along the way, um, and for anyone who's listening, if any of you use things like FaceTime or WhatsApp or Skype or Messenger and you're freely talking to people by clicking on a, um, an icon, not thinking about where they are, where that person you're communicating with is in the world or how long you're going to talk to them, and you're doing it for free, well, you're welcome. 
Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Uh, Good cause, point. Cause, yeah. Cause I, I, one of the things I did do is I did help change the way the world communicates because in, in January 2003, I had a premonition that, the, that coming out of 9-11 and the effects and the telecom crash and the dot-com crash, that the phone companies would realize how disruptive broadband could be to their future. And I wanted to take a defensive strike first. <laughs> I went to the attorneys who helped me create the, the Vine Coalition, and we filed the petition with a very simple ask for regulatory clarity that voice communication that starts on the broadband internet for not to be regulated as telecom. And it um, sounded easy, and well, it wasn't so easy because we put out, you know, not every petition that's filed goes out, but 10 days, but, but a few days after I filed my petition, 10 days later, it went out for public comment. And then I had a, then most of the world was against it because it's easy to be against and for. Mm-hmm. And then um, I had 30 days to reply. And then, then in May of 2003, the FBI and the DOJ went after me, which was a rather funny, humorous, but. In the end, um, I answered their questions, and we were there. To, we were all working on the same team. I got to go to the. F, I got to meet with them and the White House. And in uh, February 12, 2004, then chairman of the FCC issued something called the Pulver Order, and I, and I became a subject now in Washington. Since then, the Pulver Order has been honored in over 100 countries around the world. Stanford University in November 2004 issued a case study, and it's all about how one person, uh, collectively all of us, yeah. but how we can make a difference. And so um, I did help change the way the world communicates, because yeah. that law makes it so that e- today even Apple, Microsoft, Google, Facebook... None of them are regulated as telecom service providers, but all of them support applications that, in fact, help people communicate. Right. No, oh, it's been a tremendous, tremendous ride. Uh, it's been a lot of fun to be along on the ride with you, to say the least. Oh, it's, and, it's, it's fun. Yeah. It has its ups, its downs, and it, we go sideways. But it's. Yeah. But I, I'll tell you this. I think in 2019, it's harder to communicate with someone today than, than, than all those years ago because, look, there was a time when I had a phone in my house. And I got into AI programming. I, one of the things that inspired me to write code is I had a next-door neighbor. He actually lived across the street from me. Mm-hmm. And I had a tape recorder. Mm-hmm. And every once in a while, I would pre-think. Our, and our phone conversation is so predictable that I would pre-record my answers to him, call his number, he'd answer the phone, I'd be play, play pause, play pause, play pause, play pause, play pause, and I'd hang up. And, <laughs> and I did that repeatedly to this poor guy. And <laughs> I realized that, you know, you can anticipate something and take action. And that was part of, like, that learning process and yeah. and but you get to be creative right and you get to help um, help, yeah. help see that future unwind and yeah. for me it's really been about um, c- connecting people with people and and really being there for those opportunities but when there was a phone in my parents house which we used to be I think uh, two like, like three four seven uh, three four seven nine seven four whatever it was it was it was one number yeah. and you either called it or not and either I was on the phone or not available and then we had an answering machine so we could we could hide from the phone call right. and then but of course people could leave a message and, and it took forever till people started leaving messages but they did that. And that's how you reach Jeff or anyone else in my family. And then, then this and all these other modalities of communication opened up. And today in 2019, oh my God, all right? So forget yeah. about email. And then let's say, and phone numbers, right? Because if you're going to phone someone, you could have text them. Now what do you have? You have WhatsApp. You have right. Signal. You have Telegram. You have FaceTime. Messenger. Yeah. You have FaceTime. Yeah. You have social media platforms like, oh my God, I post something on Facebook. And you liked it. I'm supposed to understand that we're communicating because like, you touched my my top. Yeah. I'm like, right. you have no idea that that presence is really misunderstood, that it's not being present. It's sharing your presence. Right. Um, so with Facebook, now, now there's Messenger on Facebook, so you can send me a message. You can send me a comment. Comment. You can go on my Instagram. If you like one of my pictures, I'm supposed to understand we're talking to each other because you like one of my pictures. Sure. You can send me a message on, on Instagram. And, and all of a sudden, you have passive aggressive and aggressive and passive. And it's like, ah, how do you communicate? How do you connect? And it's like, hello, my name is Jeff. You could send me an email. I know. And at the end of the day, it's not until you go face to face. I mean, in 20. 20- 19, I still think that the more virtual we become, the more we need to have face-to-face meetings because nothing's going to, perhaps something will, but to me, nothing will replace the intimacy of of, of being next to somebody. Or breaking bread with somebody, right? Sharing a hug, something which is what for you, it offers a meaningful way to connect. And so we have all these modalities of how to communicate, and I might have my preferences, but if you really want to reach me right now, good luck. Even if I have the intention and purpose to want to talk to you, you don't know where I am, and you don't know how to find me, even if I want you to find me. 
Right. Because we have too many ways to communicate, and it's not going down. Right, yeah. No, it's very, very confusing, and that's all part of us starting to sort out the applications and use cases, et cetera, as, as, as we, we go forward. And as out, more applications come into being. Right, And so right. if you talk about blockchain, I have a vision for a personal blockchain for everyone in the world. I call it the 8, the eight billion chain project. Mm. Where on my chain, and so it's authenticated that it's Jeff's chain, I publish my preferred way to communicate with me. Right. And I update it. And it ultimately should be transparent to the endpoints. So I, it's published how to communicate, but it's, it's in a private key. Right. And if I shared with you my public key, um, you should be able, and I, you, can, I, I, you find, can find me. Yeah, find it. And, anyway. and that way you can figure out whether it's to text me, to call me, to WhatsApp me, whatever, and or FaceTime. It's exciting stuff, exciting stuff. Well, listen, hey, we've had a great conversation. I, I, I can't thank you enough for spending a couple of minutes, and you really, you, uh, you shared a great story, and it's been, it's been quite a ride, and I look forward to where it goes from here. And maybe we can catch up again sometime in the next few months and kind of hear, learn about some of your other uh, initiatives and other endeavors. Uh, uh, and where we're going from here. So hopefully you can spend a couple more minutes with us down the road. I'd be an honor. Thank you. All right. Thanks again, Jeff. Thank you. This episode is sponsored by Telco Bridges, makers of free SBC session border controller software and high performance media and signaling gateways. For more on Telco Bridges, visit telcobridges.com.